Here's the scenario. You're injured in a collision and your insurance company is denying your claim. It happens far too often. If it happens to you, call me, Brian Goldfinger of Goldfinger Personal Injury Law. My team and I work for people just like you. We don't accept cases on behalf of insurance companies, so you and your family can make sure that you're in good hands. Visit goldfingerlaw.com and get us working for you. Get Goldfinger today. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to you. Hello and welcome to the Raptors Reaction Podcast. I'm Mo Samson Folk, and you're joining me after the Raptors' very disappointing, very humbling loss to the Boston Celtics, losing 112 to 94. Not a great game, not a great game at all. But I think it's important that we all kind of decompress a little bit. We'll walk through what went right in the game, which wasn't very much. We'll walk through what went bad in the game which happened to be quite a bit, and we'll come out on the other side a little bit more knowledgeable, hopefully, and we'll be able to say, okay, the Raptors have a certain plan of action to attack Game 2 and onward in the series. So let's let's jump into it, and we couldn't start anywhere else except for the first quarter. So basically, what happened in the bubble game, in one of the seeding games, the only one that the Raptors lost, in fact, the only game that the Raptors lost in the bubble prior to this game, was against the Boston Celtics, and largely the struggles that showed up that game were struggles that showed up this game as well, in which we saw almost universally the Raptors struggle to create good looks early on in the game, and by the time they kind of got the pace of the game to where they liked, it was already way, way, way too late. Going down 16 points in the first quarter, not really a viable option. If it was against a truly bad team and you're kind of hitting the snooze button as you first come out of the gates, I get it. But against those teams, when you lock down, when you start battling back, you can make meaningful progressions the whole game if you want to. That's how good the defense usually is. That's how incremental the offensive steps usually are. But when we're looking at this game, the Celtics remain a very good team whether the Raptors want to lock down or not. So... Every counterpunch they made after going down 16 was effectively, it was a moot point because the Celtics, they got a little run of their own going. When the Raptors would get a 7-0 run or a 7-2 run, the Celtics would get a 5-0 run. They'd they'd always have that little counterpunch and it was because they were dangerous going downhill. They were hitting their three-point shots and they didn't have to do it that often because the Raptors, even at the end of the game, could not say that they figured out what the Celtics were doing defensively, or at least if they did figure it out, they did not figure out how to attack it, how to glean advantages against it, and what they did have was basically a fairly static, fairly unimaginative offense that got dominated by an impressive and well-orchestrated Celtics defense. And the stat notes from the first quarter was that it looked like Siakam was going to be on. He had a really nice end one little drop step against Jalen Brown in the post. And I was like, okay, he's got it. He missed a layup against Marcus Smart before that. He missed two bunnies after that. And it made me say, okay, he's getting to his spots. He's finding good shots for himself. He just has to make it. You know, ideally he would have been four of four for like nine points at that point in time. But instead he had hit just one shot. He got a little bit discouraged away from the rim. He tried his hand at a couple three-pointers. He bricked those. And when I say bricked, he did not come close to making those. But after that, Siakam basically only went to the post-up. He didn't even try to get to the bucket in transition, really. He was just doing these static, unimaginative post-ups. And he had very little success in this game because the Celtics, while they aren't as big as Siakam on ball... They're very good defenders, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Marcus Smart, whomever, they can guard him. Like, not maybe the best of anybody in the league, but they certainly have the tools to guard him, especially when they have a very accomplished, very help-conscious defense sitting and waiting in help side for when, if Siakam turns middle, which he often tried to do, they make him so that he can't extend to the opposite side of the bucket. He has to throw up these awkward-leaning, one-handed floaters, and that's just... That's not good offense. So Siakam, who looked like he might have a good start to the game, that wasn't the case. 
that was bad. Serge Ibaka, who had a fantastic start to the game on the offensive end, really happy to see him. He came out and immediately cashed two triples. The green light that he affords himself and constantly shows himself, I think is extremely valuable on this Raptors team. You need Serge to come in and view himself as a bucket getter. And that's what he was. I mean, he finished with 15. It wasn't a huge surplus of points in this game. But especially early on, he was a major part of the offense because he was willing to take the shots. And the Celtics, because of their game plan, their dropping defense, when he was on the floor, it allowed for him to become, you know, a shot maker. And Gasol, prior to him, wasn't making shots. And also Gasol wasn't making shots. And outside of when they played zone, was not playing good defense. He had a lot of trouble navigating how to guard the Celtics in this one. Daniel Tice kind of ate his lunch. There are, of course, some caveats when it comes to Serge is that he had trouble navigating the pick and roll defense when Kemba Walker was on the floor at the same time as Serge. It, you know, they got a couple rim runs out of it. And Kemba, I thought he he kind of roasted Serge a couple times. But overall, I think Serge was a positive. He is a, a one of the lone bright spots of this game. If he keeps playing like that, I think that's important for the series. It's a very important development. Fred and Kyle both really forcing stuff early on. Well, I, I should say Fred not forcing stuff. Kyle forcing stuff, definitely. Kyle, not a very good start to the game. Tried to grift. As we all know, he he's a bit of a grifter, kind of like a Jimmy Butler, Kyle Lowry specialties. You want to work your way to the line when things are going really slow. But in this case, it just ended up being turnovers, sloppy possessions. It just looked like it was not shaking out for Lowry. And he had a really tough start to the game. Fred, kind of the same thing that we saw happen with the 76ers last year in that series is he's getting squeezed into the middle of the floor. And when he's squeezed into the middle of the floor, he's not comfortable there, especially when you have Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, Daniel Tice all lurking. It means that the seams he usually finds to play make to the corners for either OG or Pascal to shoot it, they're not there. He's not seeing those passing lanes. He's also not a fan of shooting from the middle of the floor. He likes to take his shots either at the rim, where he's not super great. And in fact, he's actually, you know, statistically bad at the rim. Or he likes to take those pull-ups or catch-and-shoot options, relocating from beyond the arc, of which he's very good at that. And I think he was fantastic in the Nets series, and he's been fantastic in the bubble. But he's getting pushed into the middle of the floor, having to reset a lot of possessions, and basically not creating any type of meaningful offense for the Raptors. So, what we're looking at, and OG was like the forgotten man, because the Celtics, they played off of him, they forced everybody, they really want to either press you way out past the three-point line, so that you were effectively a nothing on offense, or there was room on the inside if the Raptors could get downhill, and the Raptors could not get downhill. When they did for a couple possessions, OG, I thought, did a great job of creeping baseline and finding a spot against a, you know, a shifting open defense so that he could come in for a dunk or a little duck in, something like that. But overall, the Raptors completely getting dominated. On the other side of things, the Celtics getting downhill, the Raptors squeezing into the lane to try and stop that downward forward momentum. The Celtics very happily just spraying the ball to the corner. And as we saw in this game, if you've seen the statistics or if you watch the game, the Celtics made an absolute killing in the corner three. They destroyed the Raptors in that area. And the Raptors, as we know, the way they run their defense, they typically give up a lot of those shots. Although typically they go to guys like Brad Wanamaker, Marcus Smart, who Marcus Smart is a really good pull up three point shooter for some reason, but he's kind of a very meh catch and shoot three point shooter. Want to make her smart. They hit their shots in this one. You know, I guess sometimes you make the shots. Sometimes you don't. Marcus Gasol, guy who shoots over 40% from downtown. He's not making any. Guy, Pascal Siakam, who, you know, shoots around 36%. Not making any. Fred Van Vliet, not making any. And guys like Brad Wanamaker, Marcus Smart, they're going off. There's always going to be a level of variance to these games. That's where the microscope is for a lot of it, but it's also in the process of how you create these shots. The Raptors, a lot of Fred's three-point opportunities were three-point line extended, and they were not super easy shots. A lot of the shots that Wanamaker, Smart, whom Semi-Ojale, those guys took, 
were good shots that were created by the Celtics getting downhill, creating against a moving defense, and creating good shots. The Raptors had very little of that. And even still, they they threw in a zone defense in the second quarter. They went jumbo, and it looked like, okay, they might be able to get back in the game, but that just wasn't the case. They played good defense. They allowed 20 points in the second quarter, and they still they didn't make any headway because they couldn't create against the Celtics. And even when they did, it couldn't be capped off by a made shot on that possession. It was just so many things working against them. And they didn't help themselves out at all. So they got completely trounced in the first half. And they tried to get back into it the whole rest of the game. They even had, you know, something close to like a very classic Kyle Lowry third quarter. He was fantastic. But that just wasn't enough. And in that third quarter, we're still looking at the Celtics. You know, it was like they took turns in this game. Jalen Brown was dangerous for a little bit. Daniel Tice made good decisions on the short roll for a little bit. Marcus Smart kind of putting his defender in jail in the pick and roll. Kemba Walker, pretty rapid in how he was able to move around the court. He looked sharp on offense. No matter what they were doing, it led to a decent shot. And in a lot of cases, a corner three-pointer. And that was why the Raptors, despite... You know, a great push from Kyle Lowry, a fantastic push where he was trying to revive this comatose transition offense where the Celtics transition defense in this game was really, really impressive. And they didn't let the the Raptors get out ever. It just didn't happen. They did not have a good game in transition. Pascal Siakam not even getting like any transition points. That's a huge deal. Fred Van Vliet loves to push in transition. He loves to shoot in transition. He loves to pass in transition. The Raptors build a lot of their offense in transition and the Celtics just made them squeeze into that that gross hunting two-point shots type of offense in the half court and it completely moved the Raptors away from everything that they like to do and that is why you know this this game was so good for the Celtics and so bad for the Raptors is the Raptors even if they lose typically are able to dictate pace and they're able to dictate how the other team operates on offense that didn't happen it, neither of those were true in this game the Raptors were thoroughly dominated from the opening whistle to the final buzzer it just did not happen for them and that Lowry push where he's constantly getting into the paint he's finally able to turn the corner and guys like Tatum it was nice to see but the the Celtics they just were creating too easily against the Raptors and the Raptors way too much of a heavy load to create all the time against the Celtics defense nothing was coming easy you see in the general flow of a game the Raptors might be able to just run a pick and roll and you see that it's like a quick little pocket pass and the guy gets a layup or a dunk those just didn't come in this game every time the Raptors scored especially on the inside it looked like there was so much action that went into it and it looked like Kyle Lowry had to kill himself to get to the bucket before a dump off pass or before throwing the ball wildly at the rim and then getting free throws it just it was very tough for the Raptors in this one there are adjustments left to be made but they were completely dominated by the Celtics in this one so hopefully we see Nick Nurse kind of go to the drawing board come up with some concoctions some lineups that he thinks might be able to help and mix in with that an ability for the Raptors to hit three-pointers something of that nature those two things are very important there are adjustments that are left to be made whether or not you know Marcus Saul because he wasn't even as good defensively as we're used to and he didn't provide almost anything of sustenance offensively so the trade-off is usually that Ibaka is quite a drop-off defensively from Gasol but Ibaka can kind of take a lot of the space that defenses give Gasol, and Ibaka can convert that into points sometimes. And especially when guys like Fred Van Vliet or Pascal Siakam are not finding offense for themselves, they're not taking the shots, Ibaka will come in and he'll take all of them. He'll take the shots, he'll put up points, he'll put up shots, whatever you want him to do, he'll go out there and he'll do it. And Gasol, you know, if he's out there, Fred isn't scoring, Pascal isn't scoring, Gasol's creation, the, one of the biggest boons of his offensive game, is not being complimented very well. And that kind of makes him not as important on the floor. And especially if he's not going to bring it defensively, then what are we doing out here, right? So there's a lot of things the Raptors can look at, especially in giving Pascal Siakam better opportunities on offense. Give him the ball in motion. 
just so he can use some of that quickness advantage that he has on occasion. Please run some original sets to get him post-ups. You can, you can set screens so that maybe Marcus Smart is the help defender instead of Daniel Tice. And if they work hard to switch that out, then there's probably a guy open in the corner while they're doing that. Then ask Pascal Siakam to make the proper reads. And if he has deep post position, make a quick move. Don't You don't want to be putting four dribbles down and trying to turn over your left shoulder, your right shoulder, or even kind of take that drop step into the lane where help defense is there. You need to make these decisions quickly. There's a read and react aspect to the Raptors offense. And we just need to see them make the proper reads and react properly with those. But the Raptors, the final comment is that they got trounced, man. This was a bad game. The Reggie Evans award in this one, I'd like to give it to OG Ananobi. I thought that his defense was usually pretty good. And I thought he did a good job of providing some punch on offense, even if the Raptors are very inconsistent at fighting him. His role offensively is the most up and down or volatile of any of the Raptors starters. So the amount of touches he gets ranges very wildly from game to game. I'm sure everybody remembers 23 points in the opening bubble game against the Lakers where the Lakers kind of, you know, they lapsed off of him. And so he ate that space up and he made a killing on the back end. And so we're looking at a guy who is capable of doing that and needs to assert himself into some positions more. And in some cases, the Raptors need to find him more. In this game, I thought he did a pretty good job of asserting himself, actually. I was pretty happy with OG's game. He's one of the bright spots. So the Reggie Evans Award goes to him. The top quick reaction comment seems like it's uh, right up my alley. It's very long, though, so you have to you have to give me a second to read it. It's from Arshdeep Singh. Quote, <clears throat> Before everyone starts freaking out, please remember it's only game one and a series isn't decided after one game. But damn, that was tough to watch. That first quarter really cost us. The three quarters after, the Celtics outscored the Raptors 73-71, but it was neck and neck the rest of the way. Raptors need to get off to a better start next game. Raptors also shot 37% from the field, 25% from three, compared to the Celtics who shot 47% and 44% respectively. A better start and some of the shooting percentages on both sides evening it out a bit and the Raptors could definitely win game two. This is going to be a hard-fought 6-7 game series like I said before this game. Van Vliet needs to be better, but I'm more worried about Siakam. It seems like his footwork has completely disappeared and he just goes up for a shot looking for contact rather than trying to actually make the shot. It's time for Nick Nurse to run some actual plays for Siakam and let him play off the ball more if he can't post up on guys like Brown and Smart. Siakam needs to be better if he wants the Raptors to win this series, but as of right now, us fans should not be freaking out after a game. On to game two. End quote. Okay, yeah, I agree with basically everything that was said there. I think that you could probably be more optimistic. Not you. I think that we should probably be more optimistic about Fred. I think that's a good thing that you highlight. I think it's easier for Fred to access the better parts of his game than it will be for Siakam. I think this is a very tough series for Siakam, especially if he's not able to press his size advantage in the post. And the Celtics did a really great job of mitigating that in this game. Smart, Brown, Tatum, whoever. Really impressive defense. So Siakam constantly yelling, throwing his body everywhere, looking for fouls. He just didn't have anything in his bag this game. So we're going to need to see something. But it doesn't seem like that's particularly close. So Van Vliet, I agree. I think he's a guy that we can expect to be much better in game two. Siakam, his impact in this series, I don't know what that even looks like right now. Right now it looks bad. But it could get much better. But I would err on the side of it's going to be really tough for him. And yes, the first quarter completely undid so much of what the Raptors did in this game. Like they played it close. They had pretty good defensive stretches. I thought that Tatum was defended pretty well by Lowry and Co. I thought that Nurse's initial defensive matchups were interesting. So there's, you know, there's some things to like, but the first quarter completely screwed over whatever the Raptors are trying to do. So I agree with you there. Arshdeep, thank you for commenting. Uh, you're always insightful, I believe. And uh, yeah, thanks once again. But for me, that's it. That's the end of the recap. The Raptors lose big time. Game one. Whether you're getting into this in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye.